Coming up this week on the show, we got an interview with Dag Erling Smorgov, the current security officer of FreeBSD, to discuss what exactly being in such an important position is like. And of course, we're going to have the latest news, answers to your emails, and even some Libra SSL drama. Fun, fun. Right here on BSD Now, the place to be. SD. BSD Now, episode 47, Desk Challenge IV, recorded July 23rd, 2014. Hey, I'm your host, Chris Moore. And I'm Alan Duke. And we're glad to have you guys with us this week. We've got another good, exciting show coming at you. Lots of uh, interesting news to get into, so we'll get right to that. So first up, looks like OpenBSD had a hackathon in Slovenia. About 50 developers gathered mm-hmm. July 8th to the 14th. Wow, that's a long hackathon. Exactly. That's cool, though. But, uh, you know, when they spend that much time together, naturally they're going to get a lot of work done. And this hackathon was no exception. So I guess uh, just the true first weeks of July alone, there was over a thousand commits to their CVS tree. Wow. Wow. That is pretty cool. I meant to, I didn't end up getting time, but I meant to see how much there was in the FreeBSD tree in that time. Yeah, yeah. But that is awesome. Yeah, that's this is what happens guess. when you get people together and have FaceTime. It just, yeah. Uh, and it's kind of, uh, the FreeBSD developer summit, there's some like that and there's some that aren't like, some, uh, oftentimes it's more high-level discussions and deciding things rather than actually just sitting down and working, although we often have mm-hmm. the hacker's lounge with that kind of thing actually sure. happens. And, but it's always interesting to see the stuff that comes out of the, the dev summits and the hackathons. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, they have trip reports from lots and lots and lots of people. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Almost too many to mention here, yes. but we'll try and uh, a couple. Uh, so some. I guess uh, yeah. Bob Beck was planning to work on the kernel at the hackathon, but then some Libre SSL stuff happened with the Linux pseudo random number generator. So he spent most of his time with that. Uh, yep. Moid Vallet uh, worked on Libre SSL. <laughs> yep. And talks about that. Uh, and Brent Cook and one guess what he worked on. Oh, Libre SSL. Yep. Okay. And actually, <laughs> uh, we're going to be interviewing him next week. So uh, stay Very tuned cool. for that. Henning yep. Brower actually worked on not Libre SSL. He worked on uh, right. VLAN uh, packet um, BPF for doing uh, various things and also uh, IPv6 and network interface stuff. And he says that nice. he still hates IPv6. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, Martin, it looks like, fixed some bugs in the USB stack, software aid, and among other things. Uh, Mark Espy improved package code, enabling some speedups, fixed some ports that broke with Libra SSL, and some of the new changes did some work on uh, ensuring snapshot consistency. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Martin Pelican, uh, or yeah, Pel- uh, integrated read only ext4 support, so you can match your mm-hmm. ext4 Linux file systems. Vadim yep. Zukov uh, did lots of work on ports, uh, including. Uh, working on getting KDE 4 into OpenBSD. Mm-hmm. And what did Theo do? It looks like he uh, created a more secure system call send syslog and did a lot of work in Etsy, SysMerge, and RC scripts. Mm-hmm. And uh, Paul, uh, how do you pronounce the last name? Lerafti? Yeah. Like worked on the USB stack. Uh, so that's and specifically cool. for the Octeon platform, which is uh, one oh, of the okay. little embedded processor things. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sebastian worked on relay D filters and more IPv6 stuff. Uh, Jasper worked on Puppet packages and the bootloader. Jonathan Gray uh, imported even newer Mesa libraries and did uh, hmm. a lot of work on Xenokara, which is the uh, OpenBSD fork of Xorg, and including mm-hmm. work on installer for... Uh, our work in the installer for auto detection on um, oh, nice. X stuff. Uh, Stefan Sperling uh, did uh, work, fixed a lot of issues with wireless drivers. That's always mm-hmm. good to see. Uh, Florian Obzer did uh, IPv6. Ingo Suarez worked on Mandoc uh, and mm. rewrote a bunch of uh, the CGI interfaces, including the, uh, mm-hmm. the way you read the man pages on the openbsd.org is much improved now. That was nice, nice. to see. And uh, Ken Westerback hacked on DH Client and DHCPD and got dump working on 4K sector drives. Nice. Yeah. And uh, Matthew Herb looks like worked on updating and modernizing parts of Xenokara as well. So uh, 
Yes. Dang, that's a lot of stuff happened in uh, yeah. during their hackathon. <laughs> they had quite the hackathon. So, yeah, that's like a whole release cycle's worth of stuff right there. Yep. Here we go. Just a couple and weeks. One, well, that was most of that happened in the one week while they were there. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's crazy. Nice. Yeah, that's really cool. Next up, this is actually kind of a hot topic at the moment, but yes. uh, the FreeBSD PF discussion is really taken off. I know yes. we've mentioned this the last couple of weeks, but it has just kind of gone to new heights from there. Yeah, I guess, so it, I guess. it started over on the PF mailing list uh, the, mm -hmm. and then moved over to FreeBSD questions and then FreeBSD current and to involve more people. And, uh, you know, it started off with someone just kind of wondering what's the status of PF and, and what's the plan going forward. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it got went kind of crazy from there, but uh, one of the people that's done uh, a lot of the work on PF, uh, mm -hmm. he uh, had some made a reply on here, and he was saying that uh, as of right now, uh, he's not aware of anyone doing active development on PF on FreeBSD specifically. Uh, sure. And he says that following OpenDSD on features uh, would be very cool to get any features that the newer mm -hmm. uh, PF on OpenBSD has. But doing bulk imports of their changes uh, probably wouldn't be possible anymore because of uh, the changes from uh, not only the SMP stuff, but vImage and a bunch of other things and just how sure. different the networking stacks are between uh, FreeBSD mm -hmm. and OpenBSD. Uh, and also just bulk imports like that often produce bad quality ports of PF and it'd be better to actually pick out individual features, uh, import them and, and make those work well rather than trying to just take everything. Um, mm -hmm. And so I guess one of the questions that came out of that is what features are there in newer OpenBSD PF that people on FreeBSD uh, really want? So what's the priority there? Well, I guess a lot of that, of course, is going to be newer syntax and whatnot. Well, there's but the I newer know, uh... syntax, but other than that, is there actually a feature in PF that's missing currently? Mm-hmm. So we also have some interesting reports here from Baptiste kind of pointing out that multi-thread support is not the only difference between FreeBSD and OpenBSD versions. And that's uh, obviously, uh, obviously further complicates any kind of yeah, bulk import. Uh, definitely, and, such as like vImage support, for example. Yeah, uh, even though PF and vImage don't get along very well, there's a lot of plumbing that went on there. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, as we mentioned before, back at, I remember at VBSDCon, uh, some people got Baptiste drunk and made him agree to work on importing uh, some of the newer PF stuff. And uh, I hadn't really heard anything about it. And uh, when I asked him about it, he uh, replied on the mailing list saying that uh, he had made some efforts to actually update FreeBSD's PF with some of the newer stuff from OpenBSD PF. Uh, but he ran into some problems and ended up breaking PF. And so he mm -hmm. <laughs> had to revert his changes. Uh, and he says that while he's still somewhat interested in porting individual PF features that are relevant to the way he uses PF over, uh, he doesn't think a full sync is really practical and he's not sure. interested in doing a full sync or being the overall maintainer of PF and FreeBSD, but he mm -hmm. would be willing to work on specific features if they were of value to him. It's not like he's busy enough, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's what he says. <laughs> he was working on it, uh, but then, you know, the we got all these great ideas on what to do with the package system in 1.3, which just came out, and 1.4 and 1.5. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, 1.5, we're barely starting on 1.4, and we already have plans for what's going to be in 1.5. That's and right. And so, you know, he's pretty busy. Plus, you know, he has a day job still, so. Sure, sure. Um, Only so many hours to go around, and uh, we need, sounds like we need some volunteers to step up. Well, though, specifically, yeah. If you want to so see we're looking for CPF updated. Uh, volunteers are people that actually want to do the work. You know, there's, mm -hmm. basically everyone on the mailing list agrees that updating PF would be a good thing. Just sure. nobody really wants Who's to do it. do it. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, looking for people to oh. actually work on that, you there's Looks mentorship like available. Mentorships. Yeah, yeah, if, they're if, they're available. If you have, if you're working on it and you run into a very specific problem, there are people you can ask, and they're more than willing to help. They just can't shoulder the entire thing themselves. Uh, and mm -hmm. even Henning Brower, the guy who wrote a lot of uh, PF and OpenBSD, says he said on multiple occasions he's very willing to help people uh, understand his code and you know answer questions and and help get it ported over. Uh, mm -hmm. And then for funding, you know, all if you're interested in actually doing the work, you can apply to the FreeBSD Foundation for funding, and they fund projects like this. Yeah, this would be a good candidate, I think, for a FreeBSD Foundation project. Exactly. Uh, and a lot of times it can just come down to someone actually starting the work in order to get other people excited about working on it together. 
right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, Libre SSL. They, they, one person kind of came up with the idea and started working on it, and then everybody jumped in to help. And yep. I think that's all that's really missing here is that Somebody's just got to grab the flag and run with it on this one, and everyone else will start uh, helping out, hopefully. Exactly. Like, uh, that's how we got ZFS and the FreeBSD installer. It's like mm-hmm. nobody, everybody thought it was a good idea, but nobody had done it. And so I sat down mm-hmm. on an airplane and started working on it, and I came up with a horrible draft that wasn't that useful. But uh, talking about it and working with people, we actually uh, got other people got involved in. and got excited about it, and we built it, and then it's been improved and it's gone very well. And so I think, yeah, it just comes down to, you know, the blank page is the hardest place to start. So if we get Mm -hmm. uh, somebody that wants to actually uh, get their hands dirty and get some of the work done, they might actually uh, be able to help. And there are Mm -hmm. actually other ways to help. If you're not, say, the kernel programmer that can work on firewalls. uh, Sure. It's part of the problem. Definitely. Yeah, part of the problem is that searching for documentation online for PF is troublesome because the syntax between OpenBSD and FreeBSD have diverged now, Uh, Mm -hmm. and FreeBSD's man pages and some of the documentation still point to OpenBSD uh, for the rest of the documentation. And now that OpenBSD has updated their documentation, it it doesn't actually make sense anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so that doesn't work like it's supposed to, according to the example. Yeah. So some of the FreeBSD documentation could be beefed up uh, to, to. be correct for what's currently in the system and uh, you know even if that's just going through the uh, OpenBSD archives and pulling out some of that documentation from the older version and and, and sorting mm-hmm. it out mm-hmm. uh, I guess the discussion even talked about importing PF patches from PF Sense though uh, yes like. so the guys at PF Sense have been doing some work uh, to mm-hmm. improve the PF for, that they, they use uh, specifically because they're working towards uh, moving to FreeBSD 10 for some of the the additional uh, SMP changes that went into free B- uh, PF in FreeBSD. Uh, and so they've been mm-hmm. porting over some features and patches and stuff. Uh, but there's uh, you know, been some questions about what the license they'll have on those yeah. patches are. And I imagine it'll be fine. It's just a matter of actually... Got to clarify it. Yeah, getting, you, you getting people talking and finding you know, time. <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, everybody's very busy. <laughs> and uh, True. it's just a matter of, of sorting that out and, and making that actually happen. Well, it looks like the threads kind of got a little off topic as some yeah, more disagreements you know, came up. Uh, you know, some people were not being helpful and being like, oh, well, I just use IPFW, so I don't care. It's like, sure, yeah. but... That didn't add anything to the conversation. Right. That's and good for you, though. <laughs> it is important to remember that PF isn't the only firewall in FreeBSD. IPFW sure. is very good and very fast. Um, the place where I find it lacking is doing NAT. I can do everything else in PF, IPFW, and I'm very happy with it, and I use it even on top of PF sometimes because, you know, the dummy net flow control stuff is very, very powerful and I love it. Yeah. Um, it's just when I'm doing elaborate NAT, basically when I need to do port forwarding with NAT, I end up having mm-hmm. to use PF. But uh, when I'm just, you know, when I was at the, the FreeBSD Developer Summit and I fired up a Beehive uh, and I needed to NAT it out to the internet, I could just use IPFW. I knew all the commands off the top of my head and, sure. and it was easy to do. Uh, but, yeah, it was a bit more complicated if I wanted to do, you know, if I was doing port forwarding just into that beehive, again, I could do that. It's easy in IPFW. It's just when you get more mm-hmm. complicated rule sets and you want to be able to change stuff, it's sometimes PF is better. Uh, and sure. so, yeah, it was just many things happened there. But, yes, uh, <laughs> many users were very vocal about wanting the newer PF, although you know, some of the developers questioned, well, which features of the newer PF did you want? Like, mm-hmm. you, you can't just, you know, we want the latest because it's the latest. We need, like, what specific features are that are missing that you want, and we can actually maybe get that done. You know, sure. asking for small things is easier. <laughs> Ask mm-hmm. for one feature Definitely. at a time instead of just saying, we want everything now. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, cool. So I guess uh, the only known problem with FreeBSD PF is IPv6 fragments and, of course, some of the vImage quirks yeah. that uh, still exist. Um, looks like Gleb Smirnoff uh, chimed in as well about some of the FreeBSD-specific SMP patches, saying that uh, Henning's claims of OpenBSD's improved speed are uncorroborated. Well, so, yeah, there was no, a, either side is really published. A video from well, uh, actually, we did have uh, you did find one. Yes, we do have some uh-huh. benchmarks of uh, comparing FreeBSD 9.2 and FreeBSD 10 to OpenBSD 5.4. So the benchmarks okay. are from like November of 2013. So they're not the latest, sure. but it's you know mostly represents what's was current at the time. And mm-hmm. uh, so, they, yeah, um, Henning says that in 
uh, OpenBSD, they made some improvements in uh, specifically with the algorithms and the locking and stuff that made it about four times faster. Uh, but whereas the uh, SMP had, you know, obviously its own effects. But uh, mm -hmm. Olivier uh, Cocard Levé uh, from the FreeBSD or the, the BSD router project, BSD router. which they basically make uh, an appliancey version of FreeBSD designed to replace a Cisco router. Right. Rather mm -hmm. than, you know, PFSense is kind of designed to replace your home router. This is to replace sure. an enterprise router. So it's like doing BGP and stuff as opposed to NAT. Um, mm -hmm. And they ran some benchmarks on, uh, I think it was a quad core machine with uh, 10 gig internet or 10 gig Ethernet cards. And mm -hmm. uh, so they have uh, not only just the graph of the results, but they actually provide the raw data from their experiments and the scripts they use mm. so that you could rerun it on different hardware and see how that changes it or make certain tweaks and see if you can, uh, you know, change the numbers and, and get different results. And uh, Interesting. yeah, the very, it's, it's the more proper approach to benchmarking is like, you don't just give us your results. You give us everything so that we could get the same results if we had the same hardware. And so we can run it on different hardware and see how that goes. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at his graph here. Some interesting results here about the cores FreeBSD 10 slightly faster yeah. than some of the benchmarks to 9.2, but quite a bit faster than OpenBSD 5.4. Yeah. For forwarding because, PF stateful. Uh, you know, at, at a certain point, OpenBSD runs into the limits of not having SMP, and it's something they're working mm -hmm. on, but... Sure. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Definitely, uh, there will probably be ongoing discussion about this yes, in the next but few in general, weeks, I would imagine. Everybody agrees that updating PF is a good thing. It's just um, a matter of, for some people, it's more of a priority than it is for other people, and, and it comes down to somebody actually has to do the work. So mm -hmm. hopefully someone will volunteer. Cool. Okay, next up in the news, moving on to something new, but yeah, we've been talking about it for a while now, Libra SSL progress update. So I guess uh, Libra SSL's first few portable releases, of course, have come out, and they're making great progress. They've released uh, 2.03 a couple days ago. Yep. Um, a lot of non-OpenBSD people are now starting to get involved, sending in patches via the tech mailing list, so that's awesome. Yeah, specifically, you know, now that they have the portable version, people are actually mm -hmm. uh, starting to run it on Mac OS X and FreeBSD and OpenBSD, uh, sure. Linux and so on, and they're finding certain problems. and. Uh, you know, and of course, there's already been some drama associated with yes, all this. Yes, uh, one developer found what he called a catastrophic failure of the uh, pseudo-random number generator. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, if you constructed a certain circumstance, you could cause it to give the same random number twice. Uh, they sure. obviously fixed that, but in general, that you can't have a process and its child process end up with the same process ID number. That normally wouldn't happen, but um, they fixed the problem anyway, and that's why we have 203 available. Okay. Actually, I think the, the fix for that was actually 202, so 203 probably fixes something else. Uh, and the problem they could is really, in fact, OpenBSD. Right, I guess yes. it was just the portable version. It was, yeah, just the way it was implemented on Linux. And actually, to solve mm -hmm. that, um, it looks like uh, some core Linux kernel developers are working on building a system call analogous to the get entropy system call on OpenBSD so that it will nice. actually be... Uh, so open or so LibreSSL and a bunch of other things can actually get the the more direct access uh, specifically basically allows you to get entropy that you would normally get by opening a dev u random mm -hmm. uh, except for without having to open a file handle so that you can't do an attack against uh, libre ssl by exhausting all the available file handles so that libre oh. ssl isn't okay. able to get random from dev random or dev u random sure so it's sure. actually doing it as a system call so it doesn't involve opening a file oh that's nice yes uh and uh so yeah it was interesting to see you know, from one side, there was Linux people trying to say, no, this LibreAS is all crap or whatever. And then you have core developers like uh, Theodore So saying, right, let's, this idea they had it's for how to get the entropy is really good. We should do that. Yeah, and, this should be something we could use patches. elsewhere probably. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But I guess uh, 10 Unix, who uh, we've uh, interviewed in the past, yeah. also had some uh, good words to say, really good post on the whole situation. Definitely you should check it out. I mean, the title is This is Why Software Sucks. So, I mean... Yeah. Obviously, you got to read it just based on that alone. Yes. But just, just following up how some of this stuff's been happening here with the Libra SSL release, the portable release. And, uh, you know, if you don't want it to suck, you need to learn to get rid of some of these APIs that make it suck. Like, yeah. let's let's trim the fat here and really, really yeah. make this good. Uh, and to that end, we kind of, we asked uh, Brian Drury last week about if they had done uh, what's called an exp run, which is compiling everything in the ports tree with certain settings to see if it breaks. Uh, with Libre SSL, 
and uh, Baptiste mm-hmm. followed up and told us that they had to actually uh, started doing that, but that it currently broke a lot of things. And so uh, oh, they're yeah. slowly slogging through addressing that and figuring out how many of those are maybe just a f- small false positive or something, or how many of them mm-hmm. are like the Python thing where an application is just making a bad assumption uh, that sure. you know if you have any SSL library, we'll have this feature, which maybe we actually won't, and maybe it's mm-hmm. not actually that big of a deal. Uh, and then some of them it might actually be you know some incompatibility where a change has to be upstream to fix it. Sure, sure. So it'll be interesting to see how that progresses as well. Cool. Okay, next up in the news, preparation for NetBSD 7 is now yes. underway. It looks like the release process has uh, kicked off. The uh, uh, NetBSD 7 CVS branch should be created around July 26, so in just a couple days here, which will mark the start of the first beta period, which should last until uh, September. So if you're running NetBSD, this would actually be a great time to help test this on as many platforms as you can get your hands on. This is especially true if you're running on custom embedded uh, platforms or toasters, et cetera. We want to find out which toasters work and which yep. don't. But they're also looking for help updating docs. So if you want to get involved, uh, help update their docs, fix any bugs that get reported, that would be great. And uh, you can always hit up the links we'll have in the show notes afterwards. Um, also, they will have another formal announcement coming when the beta binaries go online, which, of course, I'm sure we will announce yep. here in a future episode as well. So uh, definitely keep an eye out for that. Exciting stuff. Lots of cool releases yep. going on. Okay, now before we go into our next segment, though, we do need to mention our sponsor for this week, which, of course, we're going to start with Tarsnap yep. today. So uh, before we get started, the URL, tarsnap.com slash bsdnow, check it out. Let them know that we sent you. And this week we have also a link to a, uh, a blog yes. post from Michael W. So, Lucas. Uh, yeah, so uh, good buddy Tarsnap is, as we've discussed, online backup for the truly paranoid. And while it's available in all of your the package repos for you know FreeBSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD, Linux, etc., so you can easily just get Tarsnap from your local package repo and be happy. Um, if you're truly paranoid, that's not good enough for you. So sure. uh, Michael Lucas has this installing and using Tarsnap for fun and profit post where he talks about uh, he had built an e-commerce site to direct sale of his books and now he needs to back that up. And so he mm-hmm. talks about why he picked Tarsnap. It's A, it's very much like tar, so we didn't have to learn a new command line syntax. And he says, if you're not familiar with tar, you really should be. Yeah, I say that's a good excuse to learn. Yep. So. Uh, the terms of service for this uh, are actually human readable and are pro- very much more reasonable than what you get with a lot of backup services. You know, I mean, my lawyer doesn't have to read exactly. it to tell me you're Colin, really getting screwed Colin over. Did a lot of work to make sure that that's readable by regular people and understandable as well. Mm-hmm. The yep. code for the client is actually open and auditable. You can actually take a look at it, make sure, and take that code and compile it yourself rather than maybe using the package from a repo or something so that you know the code you just audited is exactly what you got when you compiled it. Sure. And he also says uh, when the Tarstep author screws up, he admits it and handles it correctly. Uh, and he says it's mm-hmm. cheap. Uh, any backup system that's priced in Pico dollars gets his attention. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And then he also adds that he also sees Colin Percival, the author of uh, and the owner of Tarsnap, at BSD conferences on a regular basis, and he can slap him in person if he does something truly daft. <laughs> so you can't do that with uh, various exactly. other providers we could mention. <laughs> uh, so he mentions, you know, what you need to cool. uh, get started is uh, GNUPG, which you can install from your package system, or Bootstrap mm-hmm. again with the same kind of stuff. And then a compiler, which you know FreeBSD already comes with, make, open SSL, uh, Glib, system header files, and so on. Uh, so if you go okay. to the Tarsnap download page, you can download that quick. Uh, and then use mm-hmm. your GPG to actually verify the signature on the code and make sure that what you got wasn't modified by somebody between when it left, uh, between what Colin published on his website and what you actually got and make sure that it's the same thing. And then from that, you just... Uh, run the configure script and compile it and install it. And then you set up your uh, key and you're good to go. And it walks you through actually taking a backup, seeing what backups are already on the service, uh, you know, taking a second backup. So you get your incremental, seeing the list and seeing how much space each of those is taking and so Mm -hmm. on and so on. So that's that kind of that walkthrough of using Tarsnap that, uh, that way, you know, if you're just getting started, Very, you can kind of see what's going on. Sure. 
definitely very simple to get yeah. started. And of course, you can just sign up for an account on their site, and as he mentions, just put a couple bucks in it. Five bucks. That's, will suffice, that's the other thing. You know? Unli- it's not a lot to exactly. get started. That's the other thing is unlike a lot of cloud services, you put the money in and then use it. So you can't mm-hmm. spend more than you meant to because you only have available the funds you put in. Sure. And, uh, you know, that means you don't end up with a runaway bill that you weren't expecting. <laughs> mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, cool. Well, again, that URL, tarsnap.com slash BSD Now. Go ahead and uh, check that out. And let them know that we sent you here on BSD Now. And uh, we'll be back with our next segment in just a moment. This week, we're joined by the senior engineer at the University of Oslo and the FreeBSD security officer, uh, Doug Erling Sporgrave. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so I guess the first question we always ask is, how did you first get into BSD? Um, I first got into FreeBSD when a friend of mine uh, lent me, um, I think it must have been 215 or 216, probably 215 CD. And I installed that. I was into the uh, demo scene at the time. And uh, a, a bunch of us had been talking loosely about writing some sort of, um, of uh, operating system that would be specialized for demos uh, that would provide more than DOS but not get in the way. And uh, so we started talking about operating systems and we somehow, um, somebody ended up sending us a 216 CD. And I installed that and liked it uh, and started, I got on some of the mailing lists, started talking to people and then uh, I think around 221 or 222 I started, I more or less converted to FreeBSD um, and have been using it continuously since then. Uh, And at some point um, not long thereafter, I found a bug in syscoms, and I fixed it, and I mailed in the patch, and uh, Jordan uh, offered me a commit bit. Mm-hmm. So that's how it started. Yeah, and uh, so I guess uh, now, what features or, or things in the base system can we blame you for? Oh, well, um, libfetch and fetch. Um, uh, I'm the uh, OpenSSH maintainer. I wrote uh, OpenPAM, so our PAM implementation, and I've either written or rewritten most of our modules. Um, uh, I've done some kernel work, some device driver work. I did quite a bit on syscons. I wrote the um, the, the graphical screensavers. Um, for the, the console, um, that was something I think Jordan told me. I he knew that I had some experience with syscons, mm-hmm. and he said we have this PR um, about graphical screensavers. People have been asking for them, and um, this was the end of December. And he said if you can get one or two written by by the end of the year, then they won't be able to say that they've been asking for years, <laughs> something like that. So I wrote a simple side-scrolling uh, parallax star field, and I think that and the, the rain screensaver were the first, and I wrote them in about, well, a few hours and committed them so they would be in the tree for, uh, before the end of the year, uh, back in 98, I think. Um, uh, what else? You know, it's been 16, so I started using FreeBSD 96, mm-hmm. 95 or 96, probably 96, and I've been a committer since 98, so, uh, lots. It, yeah, I've, I've touched lots of things. It's not always easy to remember what you've, uh, mm-hmm. what you've touched, um, so outside FreeBSD, um, there is OpenPAM, which is semi-independent of FreeBSD, mm-hmm. and Varnish mostly. I, yeah. I was one of the original uh, authors there. Paul Henning did most of the work. I did some of the portability and the build system and uh, and uh, some of the uh, 
uh, early the LRU first iteration of the LRU cache and things like that. Um, yeah. If, if you'd asked me that question in advance, I could have made a list. Right, yes. <laughs> but but yeah. we decided to interview like five minutes ago. <laughs> well, yesterday, but. Um, and then, so you're also the FreeBC security officer. So you can tell yes, us a little bit about what your role is there. Oh. <coughs> Sorry. So, um, uh, on the surface, you'd say that you could say that from the user's perspective, from the user's point of view, the security officer is this guy who makes sure that security advisories get written and published. Um, but it's actually a lot more than that, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, the security officer charter actually states that the security officer is responsible for the security of the operating system. Uh, I don't remember the exact wording, but uh, so on paper, I am responsible for every single security hole in the system, not just for fixing it, but I am. I also have an a, a more of a sort of overarching responsibility for trying to prevent them and for um, trying to. Uh, improve our processes, improve our code, uh, work on mitigation, um, exploit mitigation, and uh, things like that. So um, most of the day-to-day -day work, obviously, is uh, handling security uh, advisories, um, which is quite a lot of work. but. Uh, uh, I have a good team and, a, and an excellent yeah. deputy mm -hmm. um, who's, who does that very well. Um, but um, last year we had the entire dev random um, kerfuffle, yeah. uh, for lack of a better word. And that was also, so that is an example of, um, of uh, one of the security officer's responsibilities that goes beyond uh, merely responding to uh, to uh, security bugs um, or, or to vulnerabilities, because uh, I was then responsible for uh, uh, deciding how we were going to handle this. What mm -hmm. did we want going forward? I was initially in favor of allowing direct access to RD RAN to the hardware mm -hmm. um, RNGs, and then uh, we had a uh, discussions back and forth and. Um, in the end, it was mostly me sitting down with Mark Murray and hashing it out because he wrote, I mean, he wrote it and he's doing most of the work on the new version. He's, he's, uh, he has a new version now that, uh, that we've been looking at, um, the last couple of days and that we'll be, uh, looking at some more, uh, later today. Um... Uh, you, you could. That's more of a. Um, I, I wouldn't say a strategic role, but it's 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 sort of uh, uh, deciding which security features we want FreeBSD to have as well. Right. Um, and just prioritizing. Which prioritizing ones to worry about yes, it first and, and, and trying to get. So another example, something I, I did very recently that I've been wanting to do for a long time, but I finally did it recently, and that um, I'd like to get the word out. Uh, so that um, so that people are aware of it, in the port street, there is now a, a, a feature uh, where um, you can embed a CPE, so common platform platform enumeration data in packages. Uh, there is a wiki page, uh, wiki.freebsd.org/ports/cpe, uh, that explains uh, why and how. And the idea is that. Um, we want as many packages as possible to have that information embedded. And uh, when it's there, we can uh, use uh, uh, package ng, we can, we can use package query to retrieve that information from the list of installed packages or even from the, uh, from the repo uh, uh, metadata. Um, 
so we can build a list of the CPU URIs for software that is installed on your system and compare that to the list of known vulnerabilities that you get from the uh, National Vulnerability Database. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and maybe discover that uh, you actually have a vulnerable version of whatever that we weren't aware of because we never got the advisory or something or right um, and like a, a more standardized way to enumerate yes. what's on the system to compare yes. it to yes yes uh, and the main vulnerability list yes. instead of something like VUXML yes and based on based on uh, established and widely used standards whereas VUXML is something that only we use right. also VUXML was designed for the original port system where where a, a, a port is identified by by name dash version and there might be a, a prefix in front of it etc. Uh, so it's based on string matching and it, it's very fragile and you often get false, which is very, very bad, you often get false negatives. Right. So if a, especially if a port is renamed or if you have multiple versions of the same port or if you have a port that has options so that it is sometimes installed with a different name de depending on the build options. Yeah. And uh, it, it, quite often, the view XML entry only catches one of the variants of the port. It doesn't catch it, catch all of them. So, right. port audit tells you you're safe, but you're not actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the flip side of this is that the NVD uh, is obviously a security database, and it can sometimes take a few weeks before a vulnerable uh, from from the moment a vulnerability is published with a CVE number until the database is updated, but any uh, any software that has ever had a CVE that has ever had a vulnerability that had a CVE number assigned to it has an entry in the CPE dictionary, Common Platform Enumeration Dictionary, which you mm -hmm. can also download from the uh, from the NVD uh, website, nvd.nist.org, I believe. Um, uh, so. Um, the syntax is very simple, and in many cases, you can get away with just enabling the CPE feature, and the port system will automatically generate the correct uh, CPE uh, information. Um, in many, but far from most cases, but in most cases, you only have to tweak a thing or two, like. Um, uh, for instance, the. For Perl, for instance, the correct vendor name and product name are both Perl, and that's our guess, so we're fine. For Apache, the pro the vendor name is Apache, and the product name is HTTP server, right. so you have to specify that. So this is something I really, really want to see um, uh, widely used, and uh, please look at the wiki page, and uh, please look through your ports, and if you're, if there has ever been a, a security advisory um, relating to, to one of your ports with a CVE number assigned to it, then your port has a CPE and you should add it to the package. Is there a way to get a, a CPE without ever having had a vulnerability, especially for, say, new software? Uh, you can probably contact um, MITRE. Um, uh, there probably is a way. Uh, it's so a CPE is made up of a vendor name and a product name and a version number, etc. So it, it should be fairly uh, easy to guess what your CPE is going to be, even if right. you haven't had one assigned to you. But it's probably better to contact uh, MITRE. Um, uh, there's uh, if you go to cpe.mitre.org. Uh, there is a link there to, uh, there are links there to uh, different pages with different, um, with, um, for instance, the entire dictionary and the search engine, etc. And there should be a contact address there somewhere uh, where you can contact them and, and ask for it. But you'd, I th you'd have to be the author, I guess, right. of that software to request a CPE. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so please, CPE imports. Yes.
Uh, so yes, that brings us to, uh, to software you're building now. Uh, could you tell software us that I'm building now? Yes. So you're referring to Crib. Yes. Um, uh, this is another project that's been uh, sort of uh, uh, in the slow cooker for actually for two years. It, um, uh, I needed some. Um, I needed an oath. Uh, oh, wait, um, uh, oath um, two-factor, so a one-time password, uh, TOTP, HOTP, whatever uh, implementation for work, the, um, the same algorithm that is used by uh, Google Authenticator. And at that time, I think the only available implementation was uh, there was uh, Google Authenticator itself and there was a command line implementation used by OpenBSD. And I needed something uh, for FreeBSD, and I, so I implemented that. And I started gathering, um, I started gathering that code and the bits of ancillary code I'd written for that, and collected it into a library, which I, after much, uh, after much. Um, after long consideration, uh, uh, ended up calling naming crib C R Y B, um, which is a collection of cryptographic algorithms. Mm -hmm. And the the uh, the philosophy you could say um, behind crib is to have um, a collection of cryptographic algorithms. Uh, focusing on completeness and correctness with 100% uh, unit test coverage, 100% uh, documentation, so every single API function is documented, mm -hmm. a stable, clean API uh, with guaranteed uh, ABI uh, stability, uh, and uh, an unambiguous license. So uh, since much of that code was written for my employer, uh, I chose with, with uh, my employer's um, uh, permission, of course, uh, to publish it under the three clause uh, BSD license. Um, and I have obtained uh, permission from, so I took some code from um, Colin Percival's libc Perceval, which he granted me permission to re-license under the three clause BSD license. And I obtained permission from the author of Zy SSL, uh, Christophe Devine, uh, to re-license Zy SSL under the three clause BSD license. So I'm currently working on integrating Zy SSL into crib um, and when that work is done, uh, I will have a fairly complete collection of message digests, um, uh, message authentication codes, Max, uh, and uh, RSA, AES, a few ciphers, RC4. So a good starting point. By no means a complete uh, collection, but a, a good starting point and uh, uh, hopefully the, the, the core of, of something that can, uh, can be uh, useful. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I already have, I've discussed it here at BSD CAM and I already have a volunteer for, uh, for uh, uh, SHA-3, which is completely different beast from SHA-1 and SHA-256 and 512. Um, and um, yeah, so I expect to publish the code within about a month or something. It will be on crib.to, C-R-Y-B dot T-O. Um, and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing where, uh, which direction crib will go, um, how it will be received by, by the community. And mm -hmm. uh, so my ambition is not to replace OpenSSL right. uh, or LibreSSL or whatever. I want um, a collection of algorithms with complete test coverage and uh, complete documentation. That's the primary goal. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you envision that being used? In 
Like, would that be then go as part of the base system well, for BSD and be used for instance, some stuff? Or? Yes. So, crib is uh, designed to be modular, uh, mm -hmm. which means that you could fairly easily, if you need, if you have an application, you don't want to have any external dependencies, but you need SHA-256, you can take this file and that file from crib, and you just remove those five lines of code at the bottom that reference something else, and you have a SHA-256 implementation that you can use, that you can embed into your application without any other dependencies. Mm -hmm. Uh, it can um, it cannot replace OpenSSL in, for instance, Fetch, right. because it does not implement TLS. But it can replace libcrypto uh, uh, pretty much uh, everywhere. Uh, so uh, wherever FreeBSD uses message, especially message digests, because they're used for uh, password hashing or. Uh, I am probably going to pull in um, to include key derivation functions, PBKDF. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Oath will be included, of course. Uh, so uh, the Google Authenticator, um, the algorithm that is used for uh, by Google Authenticator for uh, one-time passwords, uh, which I've been meaning to um, import into, I already have a working implementation of that. I've been meaning to import it into FreeBSD for, well, ever since I wrote it two years ago. Uh, I haven't done it because I don't have a full range of um, management tools, so key generation key, et cetera. There, I have those tools, but they're specialized uh, for the, the system for which I implemented them at right. work at the University of Oslo. Um, uh, but uh, so that's one of my ambitions is to have FreeBSD have uh, uh, a modern two-factor authentication solution yes. in base out of the box and possibly even have it certified mm -hmm. uh, by the open, uh, what is it called? The Open Authentication Foundation or mm -hmm. something, like Open Authentication Initiative, I don't remember, OATH. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh, do you think that's something you could have ready in time for 10.1 or probably not? No, 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 not for 10.1. No, it's too disruptive right. for 11, but okay. not 10.1. Um, if you're only talking about having uh, OTP in base, I could probably drop OTP in base uh, by 10.1. But uh, once again, I mean, I have key management tools, but they're not uh, very good. They're, they're ad hoc. Uh, what we really want to do is have uh, implement the um, uh, oath um, uh, PSKC standard which is an XML schema for uh, storing and transporting uh, keys mm. um, uh, have uh, an implementation of that uh, and figure out so if we're going to offer two-factor authentication, where are we, we going to store our keys? We don't want another ETC OP keys fiasco because, right. frankly, I mean, you know how OP stores its keys. It's just a single flat file with one line per user. Right. Um, we don't want that. So how are we going to do it? Uh, we need a format that's extensible because there are things that, for instance, you want to be able to store uh, the last time the key was used in order to prevent key reuse and and maybe uh, at some later date you find that there's yet another piece of metadata that you want to include. So there are many considerations there beyond simply getting it to work because I need it for this system at work and right. I can afford, it's just me and a couple of other guys, so I can afford to write something that I may have to rewrite entirely at a later point. Mm -hmm. I can't afford that when uh, when I'm working on FreeBSD. Uh, if I'm if I'm going to include this in FreeBSD, it has to be mostly right. right. So not perfect from day one, but mostly yeah. right from day one. Especially if it goes into 10.1, it will be supported for the next... If I if I have like a half-assed solution in 10.1, I'll have to support a half-assed solution for the next five years because right. of... Uh, I, I will have to, to be backward compatible with the file format that I introduced in 10.1. I'd rather do it correctly in 11 right. uh, and have to support that for the next five or 10 years. Yeah, because that gives you that window of wiggle room for the first while after you commit it. Yeah. We wouldn't get that with a, once no. it goes in release. So, yeah. so uh, how would that work 
for the way it stores keys, would you still have like a single key store that's managed by root, or would each user be able to add their own keys? That's um, that's a very good question because um, there are pros and cons, um, and I think that on the balance, it is best if you do not allow users to manage their own keys uh, because. Um, sooner or later you're going to you're going to have a user who's tired of remembering his passcode or passphrase or whatever and uh, writes a cron job that resets his key file so that it's always the same code or yeah. you know some stupid thing like that people right. users do stupid things uh, or uh, they'll try to edit their key file for whatever reason and they botch it and suddenly they've locked themselves out right. of the system yeah. or um, you want I mean you have authentication for a reason you have policies for a reason and you want to be entirely you want to be certain that you can enforce, enforce those, those. Uh, properly so yes a, a single key store um, owned by root and also with uh, with uh, any uh, OTP solution, uh, be S key or OP or HOTP or TOTP, um, the key store has to be writable because you have to invalidate a code whenever it's been successfully used. You have to invalidate it immediately. Mm -hmm. For uh, HOTP, that means incrementing the counter. In fact, HOTP doesn't work if you don't have a writable key store. For TOTP, it means um, recording the last time the key was used so that you can't reuse it within the time window. You have a 90 second or 30 mm -hmm. second or whatever, usually 90 second time window. Um, so you need a, a writable key store, so uh, you need set UID tools and uh, many, many policy questions. Do you want to allow users to change their own or generate a new key at will? Do you want to allow a user, do you want to allow users to extract their key at will? Uh, Google Authenticator does not, for instance. Um, uh, if you if you get a new phone and you didn't print out a copy of your QR code when you first enabled Google Authenticator, you have to change, you have to get a new Google Authenticator key so it will show you the QR code again so you can scan it with your new phone, right? right. Um, and that's a policy decision they made. Um, so it's... The algorithm is very simple, but the ecosystem around the algorithm is uh, is uh, very. There are many complex yeah. questions, and uh, uh, that uh, you had better get them right or mostly right mm -hmm. from day one, or you're going to regret it later. So. Okay. Thank you very much for doing. Thank you for uh, having me. Alex. We're back, getting ready to go into our news roundup. But before we do quickly, of course, we want to mention the other sponsor on the show this week, which is, of course, iX Systems. And then they got a couple of new things for us. First up this week, we got a YouTube video, which we'll have a link to in the show notes, talking about how to upgrade FreeNAS 9.2.x, kind of walk you through the process. It's actually pretty simple, but, uh, you know, it's always helpful to have a video just kind of hand-holding you, getting you yeah, through it. Uh, yeah, it was a very popular question on the forums, people having particular problems and it walks you through that so that's uh quite interesting mm -hmm. cool and then next up they also published some pictures from oscon yes. out in uh, portland yes, oregon OSCon is going on right now i think i think it's mm -hmm. not over yet uh and yeah. so they got pictures from the first couple of days you can see the uh, uh ix booth here with the free nas and they got a uh, giving away all the cds and the horns all the horns and, and yep. lots of people coming by and other things going on people we've seen like uh Michael Dexter from the Portland Linux Users Group doing uh, mm -hmm. BSD stuff. And uh, a bunch of the folks from uh, Jupyter Broadcasting, the network where we run this podcast, uh, out there running their booth as well. And uh, yep. lots of good times being had at OzCon. Well, of course, this is just a small part of what iX Systems does, yeah. though. I mean, they, they obviously s support a lot of conferences, go out and show off FreeBSD, uh, PCBSD, FreeNAS. I mean, you name it, they'll... Uh, 
anything BSD they're happy to talk exactly. about. Exactly. It's, <laughs> so. it's another way that they're a big part of the community is is actually mm-hmm. just being out there and doing this where, you know, they're if you look at their table and you see what they're doing here, they're not really trying to sell you a server. <laughs> They're mm-hmm. like, no, here, just take some CDs, go home, play with it. It'd be great. And they're yeah, also, they're out supporting the yeah, project. They're giving away some uh, paper copies of uh, the FreeBSD Journal as well. Oh, very and, nice. And, uh, very nice. Accepting donations for the FreeBSD Foundation and all that great stuff. Mm-hmm. Very cool. But of course, uh, some of the, the other neat things they can do is uh, building mm-hmm. systems. Yeah. One of the best things they're they're good at here. Yeah. Uh, if you need something small, a nice free NAS mini to toss under the desk, which me and Alan both have here, runs great, quiet. And of course, they can uh, scale that up to about as big as you need to yes. go. And we've uh, we've shown some of the monster systems yeah. in the past. Man, we'll have to get some more screens or uh, pic- captures here soon of some new stuff they're yeah, working on. Uh, but, uh, I don't know that uh, Terra filer with the. Uh, uh, What's the band set up? In yeah, front of it? Uh, there was one that has like 750 terabytes of space or something evil like oh, that. Man. It's like, wow, yeah. I want some of that. <laughs> Definitely. But that's the cool thing about IX. They can build the system uh, pretty much to your specifications. Yes. So if you have a problem you're trying to solve, they're not just going to throw you something that's sitting on the shelf. Let's try and fix your problem. Let's, let's provide a solution that... Uh, you know, at the right cost can take care of uh, the situation you find yourself exactly. in. Exactly. Like we've seen them build everything from, you know, a little FreeNAS Mini with just a little bit of space that I can stick under my desk and that works great. Mm-hmm. Uh, run my Plex Media Center off it or whatever. Uh, through, sure. you know, some guy needed 24 10 gigabit NICs and two U's. And so they built that. Like, sure, they'll do that you know, too. The FreeBSD Foundation wanted one for the Pudrier clusters. Like, yeah, we need like a terabyte of RAM and 40 processors. <laughs> Uh, Princess mm-hmm, cores, mm-hmm. and they're like, yeah, we can build that, no problem. Sure, no problem. Exactly. <laughs> but of course, because they employ so many BSD-related folks, uh, they're able to be very knowledgeable about, about what's going to happen yep. with the software interacting with the hardware, so they can make sure that, okay, you know, this BSD is going to run great on this particular motherboard, this chipset, and uh, you know, they're just really involved in the community, making sure that the, the latest hardware is indeed yeah, supported. Yeah, and well, not just the hardware, too. The software, like, you know, mm-hmm. uh, it's a lot of the uh, effort that goes into making sure that the free B- uh, the ZFS that's in FreeBSD is the latest and greatest is sure. the developers that work at IX making sure that that stuff gets ported over so that they can use it in their products because they're based on FreeBSD. Mm-hmm. So it's as much benefit to them as it is to the rest of us uh, to get all those latest and greatest ZFS features into uh, the mainline versions of FreeBSD. Yeah, which is very cool. So, of course, the URL, though, we, we forgot to give that yes. a little earlier, but uh, ixsystems.com slash BSD now. You'll want to go there. Let them know that we sent you. You heard it here on BSD now. Yeah. Fill out the form. Get in touch with their folks. Their sales guys are actually really knowledgeable about all the stuff that they can uh, produce and sell and uh, the various hardware and how that interact with the software and what it can do and what you might need to uh, take care of the particular situation you're dealing with. So again, ixsystems.com slash BSD now. Go check it out. And we'll be back right now. Uh, we're coming into our news roundup, it looks yep. like. So uh, what do we have first? Some uh, BSD CAN yes, news. Yes, uh, so this is a report on the Ports and Packages Working Group from BSD CAN. Uh, so it's uh-huh. a little late, but, you know, there was uh, a lot of things hey, happened there. Late than ever. Uh, there was, you know, 100-plus developers working on stuff for, like, three days solid. So there was a lot of stuff happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, just a quick overview of what happened at this invite-only event Uh Baptiste Dursan started the session with a status update on how uh, package building is going. Currently, mm-hmm. uh, all the packages are built within Poudrier and using the FreeBSD Foundation sponsored uh, a series of large machines to use for this, um, they can build sure. the entire ports tree in about 16 hours. Nice. Uh, although, once you then have to do that for multiple versions and multiple architectures, that's why we only get package updates once a week because it takes that long by the time you count every mm-hmm. supported FreeBSD version on every supported architecture. Sure, sure. So uh, the way it works is uh, every Wednesday at 1 a.m. UTC, which is, I think, 8, no, 10 p.m., I think, something like that, uh, Eastern, mm-hmm. they take a snapshot of the ports tree and then start an incremental build updating everything that's changed uh, since the last build. Uh, and they do that mm-hmm. for FreeBSD 9 and 10, for i3d6 and AMD64, and so on and so on. 
Uh, and then the catalog is signed on a dedicated signing machine that's not used for anything else and is kept very secure nice. and is much more restricted. Uh, the packages mm -hmm. are then moved to the four mirrors. There's one uh, U.S. West, which I think is at ISC. U.S. East, mm -hmm. which I think is at um, uh, New York Internet. Uh, one in the U.K. and then one in uh, Russia. And then uh, mm -hmm. from there, right. people can start downloading them. Uh, he Very noted cool. that... Um, there needs to be more coordination between the source people and the ports people about uh, ABI breakage. If if something's mm -hmm. going to change in head, uh, we need to make sure the ports people are aware of that and can add the right tests into their ports and, and make sure that the ports actually compile properly. Uh, and currently, the package building is only for I3D6 and AMD64, but uh, they have plans to start doing ARMS and MIPS, and so they have to start dealing with that the complications that'll cause. Uh, Back at BSD CAN, dist files were not being mirrored. Uh, so sometimes mm -hmm. you run into the problem where um, the file you want to download to compile the port or for the package builder to compile the port would be missing. Uh, the, the mirror mm. would be down or something would happen or whatever. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, that's actually fixed now. There's a, a system called dist cache uh, that is basically a fallback URL. So after the ports tree has tried everything else, it'll try that and download a copy from one of See the, the free BSD mirrors, which... Uh, they talked about changing that from FTP to HTTP. Ah, they did that as well. Like. By default, when you're fetching files uh, for the ports mm -hmm. tree, it'll be by HTTP unless specifically specified otherwise, uh, since mm -hmm. that more it works for more people behind more different types of networks and so on. HTTP yeah, is yeah. just generally better. Uh, and mm -hmm. so or better supported anyway. And so uh, that has a bunch of advantages as well. Very nice, very nice. It looks like he included some details about a package ng 1.3 yes, as well. Uh, which was still um, under very active development back then, but it was actually released mm -hmm. today, this morning. Today, yeah, so this is brand new yes, stuff. So, uh, but uh, he also talked about the old package tools and a life. Which is um, coming up as well. That's, stable uh, package September 1st, yeah. they'll kill off the old package tools. And uh, the new mm -hmm. package 1.3, the biggest update that users will notice is uh, a new dependency solver, uh, which should yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, almost entirely get rid of your the requirement to do package set, uh, where you, mm -hmm. if you're upgrading from, say, Perl 5.14 to 5.16, currently on 1.2, it would be like, oh, there's a conflict, and you would have to tell it, hey, replace this with this, and then it would upgrade. Uh, it's going to figure all that out automatically now. Nice. Nice. Okay. Well, next up in the uh, weekly news roundup, we got a cool uh, post here about cross-compiling ports with QEMU and Pudria. So uh, I guess they've added some recent QEMU features that allows you to basically chirrut into a completely different architecture. So the article goes through some of the process of, say, building ARM v6 packages on a normal x86 box. Yep. How cool yes. is this? I'm actually very excited so to see this. this. Going so this going forward would, is, is what's required to actually get into building... Um, Pack, uh, FreeBSD packages for ARM so that people with Raspberry Pis mm -hmm. can just download binary packages. Yeah. No more yes. compiling well, X on your Pi. Yeah, or exactly. Yeah, uh, currently, it has to be done on <laughs> a bunch of ARM machines, and those are fairly slow. Uh, so, this mm -hmm. basically uh, is kind of a combination of different things depending on uh, which way it's done. Uh, oftentimes, shell scripts and stuff that are agnostic mm -hmm. to the platform can be run at full speed on the you know AMD64 architecture. But then when you actually sure. get to running some test code or something that has to happen when you're compiling the port, that would actually happen in emulated via QMU uh, with this QMU user land hmm. system. So basically kind of adding support to the way that uh, we deal with it um, when you're using the Linux emulator, right? It just says, oh, that's a Linux binary. I'll run that through the sure. Linux emulator. Um, this basically does the same thing. But when you try to run it, it'll actually start up QMU to run that one binary. Up. That's cool. So I guess uh, we do need to note, though, it looks like this recent work does require a 10 stable or 11 yes. current and an extra patch for QEMU right now. So this is still some pretty uh, bleeding edge stuff ongoing, but it's really exciting to see this happen. Yeah, I, it, it requires this extra changes in the kernel, which obviously I haven't made it out to a release yet. But mm -hmm. and yeah. but, uh, it looks like, uh, I guess, November-ish, we're talking 10.1 coming out. So hopefully we'll have that here soon enough. Yeah, it actually uh, but, uh, even has the commands here showing how to compile... Uh, 32-bit ARM v6 packages. So if you have a Raspberry Pi, you could actually use, mm -hmm. you know, your beefier machine to compile packages uh, for yourself and then install off a local repo or something. And uh, seeing nice. that go forward will be very interesting. That'd be fantastic. 
Also, the uh, Podre Develop Port now actually has the option. So when you go uh, build that, it'll ask you if you want to uh, do the QEMU user option, which will pull in all the requirements. Oh, awesome. I saw that this last uh, week when I was doing some upgrades. So good job, guys, getting yes. that in. That's that's really awesome. So hopefully down the road we'll be just having package repos for everything. For sure. Okay, next up we have cloning FreeBSD with ZF.Send. So guess who? Michael Lucas has written something else this week talking about uh, a FreeBSD mail server that he runs. He wanted to have an easy way to restore the whole system if something were to happen to it, yep. of course. So the, the post is going to show his entire process and creating the mirror machine using ZFS for everything and how he did the uh, ZFS send and snapshot commands, which uh, just went hand in hand with all this, which is one thing that's really cool about the, the article is how he did the whole thing from a live CD. Pretty stinking awesome. Yeah, Anything uh, else? That is really cool. The, kind of the idea is that if you have an important production server, you can basically have mm -hmm. a standby server that's running a live CD off like MFS BSD or a live CD or something sure. and replicating everything so that as soon as something happens, you can just flip over and it's actually a bit for bit copy of everything that was on that system up to, you know, maybe mm -hmm. 10 minutes ago or something. And then it's yeah. very easy to just take over and, and everything works great. Uh, uh, I've fantastic. been transitioning to doing things like this using jails as well because you can just mm -hmm. replicate them and then just turn the jail on on the other side when you need to. Yep. Which is pretty stinking yes. cool. Yeah, that's how I migrated a few recently on some of my home systems here. It's like, oh, new server, just replicate that data over and start yeah, the jail. Uh, actually, yeah. we've been looking at doing the same thing for installing new servers, is actually to nice. build up the FreeBSD exactly the way we want it and then basically take a snapshot of that and dump that out as, as a ZFS replication file. And then when we need to turn up a new server, we boot off the live CD and then just slurp that down and push it onto the disk. I should probably mention that we already do that with the PCBSD install. Oh, is that how your installer like does an it option. Now? Yeah, yeah. We have an option with uh, the system. Once you've gotten installed, you use Life Preserver to make a replication right. to a remote box. And then the installer can just fetch that back. So you set up your disk options oh, right, yeah. and it just you replicates have, Yeah, that's back. how you do uh, like a restore of a broken system, eh? Yeah. But yeah, you could use yeah, that for we, deploying uh, new machines We've had folks in well. the offices use it for deploying yeah. as well. So they got a workstation customized with all the tools exactly the way they wanted them. And imagine... And then they just replicate them to yeah, new clients. Yeah, it's a lot faster than actually trying to uh, install all the packages because that's making all these random oh, yeah. writes. Whereas ZFS is just a big fat stream. You know, when I'm yeah. doing it over the it's LAN, just, I max out the gigabit LAN. That's like 120 megabytes a well, second. Plus they have... Everything configured for Active Directory or whatever they're yeah. using in the office. So they just literally pull it back and then reboot, and it's yeah. ready to and go. And <laughs> as so. usual, it's Michael W. Lucas, so it's all documented very, very well in his unique mm -hmm. style. Uh, yep. And I can tell you that I'm pretty sure the reason most of this is happening was, A, he mentions you know part of this was setting up something for his employer, but it's also he's working on a book on file systems and stuff, and so uh, managing disks and so on. And I'm sure this will make its way into that as well. Sure. Well, cool. Well, next up in the news, though, we're continuing on with our uh, FreeBSD overview. Um, of course, we've had the new blog series we've been watching about a Linux user switching to BSD. In part one, he gives a little background on being done with Linux distros, and he documents his initial experience on getting and installing FreeBSD 10. And in this article, he talks about how he's pleasantly surprised to be able to use ZFS without jumping through hoops and doing custom kernels and whatnot. So, I mean, how cool is that, just to have it right out of box? But uh, most of what he was used to on Linux was already in the default FreeBSD except for Bash, which I'm sure you could solve that very quickly with a simple package install. Done. But uh, part two, he's uh, detailing some of the experiences with package and G imports. So uh, we got some really cool links here. Uh, any notables you want to pull out of these, Alan? Uh, no. Not in particular. Yeah, yeah. But it's pretty interesting here. He said he wasn't able to identify the bootloader. Um, it didn't look like Grub or SysLinux. Right, so he was like, I think this is something specific to BSD. Yeah, which just, yes, uh, depending if he used GPT, which I think he did, uh, then it's there's literally a very small loader called GPT ZFS boot. GPT Linux. Uh, and yeah. it, just doesn't, it just boots FreeBSD, and that's all it does. That's all it so does. I, I think course, it's about I mean, 45 kilobytes. It's just, yeah. And mm -hmm. most of that is ZFS code. <laughs> I guess he, well, cool. uh, one well, thing he mentioned was. Um, the default shells, he had SH, CSH, or TCSH, and so on. He's mm -hmm. like, you know, where's Bash? Well, Bash is GNU licensed. So you can install it easily from the uh, yeah. the ports tree uh, or the, with the package system, or you can even have fish if you want. But, yeah, it's just not included in the base system. Mm -hmm. well, and he talks about yeah. that, too. He just ended up doing package install Bash, and then he checked, found the binary, and away yeah. he goes. So, it uh, even adds yeah. it to ETC shells, so it's easy to do. 
Mm -hmm. Very simple. So you should check that out if you've got somebody who's a BSD curious and uh, wants to hear about somebody else's experiences. It's a good way to get your feet wet with it. Well, we'll be back in just a moment with our uh, feedback and questions for the week. Well, we're back now with our weekly feedback section, and we got uh, several good questions this week. So first up, though, we have a free NAS backup from uh, Boston. And he says, about a month ago, lightning strike uh, struck three houses down my street. At that home, every electrical device was destroyed, even hard drives. Ouch. He said on his at his place, uh, just the computer, power supply, and motherboard was destroyed, not when the drive. When I had so that's lightning, good. I think everything, all my machines are protected by UPSs, so they were all fine. But lightning somehow mm -hmm. came in through the cable, over the cable line, through the cable modem, zorched my 24-port yep. managed gigabit switch, which was expensive, and somehow went down and also hit the NIC in my machine, the NIC in my PF, <laughs> one of the NICs in my PF Sense, but not the two other NICs that were all connected to the same switch. I don't, maybe it, oh, it was getting a packet the moment, like the gate was open the moment the lightning hit, and one of the two NICs in my file server. And I had to, so I, I had to go to like the computer store and just buy a box of of PCI Express Gigabit NICs to replace NICs in all of my machines. <laughs> uh, the the oh, the, the NIC on the motherboard on the the desktop machine that I had then that got hit, mm -hmm. the lights are still on. <laughs> they won't turn off. They just won't shut off. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So I had to buy a. Uh, Surge protector for Ethernet and connect that between the cable modem and my switch when I replaced my mm -hmm. $600 switch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so he continues on. He says, so far he's protected my data on the FreeNAS box by setting up some data sets and shares as read-only so unintentional deletion can't happen. And for work folders, he's enabled regular snapshots. But this, of course, obviously doesn't protect his data from uh, breaking my FreeNAS or ZFS or something or some natural disaster. Mm -hmm. That could occur. So he says he'd like to back up free NAS to USB hard drives. Drives span from 350 gigs to 1.5 terabytes. He said, I'll plug them in at one at a time and back up to them because the box doesn't have enough available USB ports for them all to be plugged in at the same time. He says, what process do you suggest? That can kind of depend. Um, mm -hmm. The nice thing about having your stuff broken up into data sets is it's easier to do this because you can find you know some data set that's less than 350 gigs and push it over. Mm -hmm. um, Sure. Uh, and so you might actually have to break up some of your stuff if it's not already broken up. But yeah, um, you can use. Uh, is is there a tool built into FreeNAS for like life preserver related or not? Well, it has replication tools. Right. Built yes. In, so, so if you, you replicate that's a, a second FreeNAS, but I guess it doesn't. You could manually. Yeah, I don't use, think um, it has like a local USB. Right. Yeah, one. you could do manually use uh, ZFS send or a script like the one that I mm -hmm. help maintain now called ZX for, uh, and basically replicate data sets to that uh, external mm -hmm. drive and basically it allows you to do incremental between snapshots so you replicate it the first time and then the next time you hook up that si the same drive again and you just change you only have to replicate what changed between uh your server and what's on the disk so that saves sure. you time on the subsequent backups and you can just do that individual beta sets although you have to keep track of which data sets are on which disks and hope that mm -hmm. you know one data set doesn't grow and now the two data sets that were on the one 350 gig disk have now grown so that in total they count more than 350 gigabytes. And you probably mm -hmm. have to come up with a pruning strategy to uh, delete old snapshots eventually so that uh, you free up the space that you're not using anymore. Sure. Uh, and then the other downside there is uh, if you delete the... Uh, when you're doing ZFS incremental replication, if you break the chain by deleting certain snapshots, then you have to either go further back and replicate or if you delete Mm -hmm. uh, if start there's on. no uh, two snapshots in common to do the replication between, uh, then you have to start over and re-replicate all the data, which can take, uh, you know, when I'm doing it over the internet, it can take days. <laughs> mm -hmm, definitely. Uh, but you can do so that. So he basically mentions that as his, his first option. Then he also asks about attaching the drives to a PCBSD laptop and then backing up from FreeNAS to the laptop through the USB disk. Well, um, if, if that sounds pretty much yeah, the same. Yeah, um, if if his only problem over. is connecting all the disks to the machine at once because of lack of USB ports, they make these things called USB hubs that allow you to mm -hmm. do that. Now, obviously, you're not going to get the full bandwidth, but the advantage, if you did hook up all the drives at once, you could actually make combine all the drives into a pool, and actually maybe make yeah. that redundant as well. So if you lose any one of those uh, 
discs you have the thing if you're you're still somewhat yeah, safe yeah uh, you will have to force it to create it if you're using discs of a different size but basically it'll use whatever the smallest disc is amount of disc of each of the discs so if you're mixing a 350 gig and a 1.5 terabyte you're only going to get mm -hmm. you know if you're mirroring them because you only have two discs then you're only going to get right, 350 gigs. gigs and that might not be enough but uh you mm -hmm. know with the right combination you could actually create a pool out of them that way and uh, of course the downside to doing a pool like that is that you would have to um have all of the disks connected at once in order to read and write the data mm -hmm. yeah um he also asks you know what you should format the usb disk ufs zfs or even ntfs well, so depending I how you think do obviously it obviously we're going to say yeah, ZFS, if you do zfs right? then obviously it's going to copy all the metadata and and the other advantage to that is in the event of the disaster, you can just mount those the ZFS mm -hmm. pools off those external disks and access individual files instead of having to wait to restore all of it. Uh, and it sure. just means they can sure. be used live, uh, which is helpful. And yes, the advantage mm -hmm. with ZFS is that you'll still have the checksum, so you'll know when something's bad. You'll be able to do a scrub on it to read everything and make yeah, sure it's still, still good. Uh, but again, if you're not having any redundancy, ZFS will find the problem and tell you your backup is broken. Uh, most mm -hmm. likely when you go to restore it. And so doing the scrub, being able to connect them everyone, you know, once a quarter and do a scrub is helpful. Uh, but with unless you're creating a pool that actually has redundancy by using multiple disks for your backup and having to connect them all at once, and ZFS isn't going to be able to do anything about it to help you. But it's better than just sure. not knowing that your file was garbled if you're using, you know, NTFS or something. He had talked about using like rsync as well. I don't know. I I guess I would need more of the ZFS. Yeah. ZFS ESN and snapshots are better, uh, and yeah. they're better at uh, using less space. Uh, with ZF, uh, if you do rsync with its option, uh, when the file's different, it has to recopy the entire file. Whereas ZFS, it mm -hmm. only has to do the blocks that changed. Sure. So yeah, that would be the way we'd recommend going for sure. Yeah. Okay, next up, we have Rick has some questions about network tuning. He says, I enjoy VSD now. Thanks for the good work. Well, we appreciate that, Rick. He says he has a couple of free VSD network performance tuning questions for us. He has added uh, some yeah, sections. He, he broke it down in into sections so, to make nice. it easier read. So, okay, first section, background, multicast data stream. I'm working with industrial equipment that generates telemetry data as multicast UDP datagrams. Average flow is 2 megabits per second with periodic bursts up to 30 megabits. A second? Yeah, and I think he was saying that sometimes he was having uh, problems where the application wouldn't receive it properly. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure so what he's doing there. Oh. Yeah, second section, he talks about FreeBSD full socket buffers. I'm running a client app written in C to receive the data on a FreeBSD 9.1 computer. He was experiencing frequent packet loss. Netstat-S showed an increasing count under UDP drop due to full socket buffers. So that oh. one specifically sounds like the app that's reading the data from UDP is not reading it fast enough. So you might mm -hmm. uh, Can't keep up. use something like Dtrace or uh, just regular analysis on your C program to see why it's not pulling the data out of that buffer quickly enough. So he said his troubleshooting he did was he ruled out a network issue by sniffing. He said all the packets are arriving at the NIC. He ruled out CPU saturation. He says it's never above 5%. Yeah, so it, it seems like your application is busy doing something else or waiting for something else and not actually picking those packets up uh, mm -hmm. uh, out of the UDP buffer. Uh, I think you so can said, after change a few, that yeah. size of that buffer somewhat. but Well, that's kind of what he did. He said after a few Google searches, he was able to resolve the issue by increasing the following values on current IPC max sock buff and uh, IPC NDP clusters. Let's see, INET UDP receive space. Yeah, I think it was and, that. And, uh, so max the connection. UDP receive space is probably the one that made the difference, but it might have also been the max sock buff. Because uh, I think sure. the default is 2 megabytes, and he put it up to what looks like 3.5 megabytes. Mm -hmm. So what he's asking is, is there an authoritative source to learn about the implications of adjusting these parameters? The handbook has some guidance on N NMB clusters, but he did not see information on the others. So he's basically asking, what are the unintended consequences yeah. of making these um, changes? There's a couple things. Um, man tuning, uh, the man page mm -hmm. for tuning, uh, has a lot of talk about it, especially the ones that he was changing there. Um, also, if you run sysctl minus D, there are descriptions of each of the sysctls, some of them give a good explanation. Some of them are a little vague. Um, there was a project actually by uh, Doug Erling, uh, our guest from this week, uh, to improve the documentation for the sysctls, uh, but he ran into some hangups and never got around to finishing it. Um, mm -hmm. There are quite a few resources you can look at on top of man tuning and, and more stuff in the handbook. And, you know, uh, 
people have done some pretty good blog posts and stuff about how some of that stuff works. Um, and yeah, I, I think I still think part of it was his application was waiting for something and not picking up the data sure. soon enough. And then by increasing the buffer size, he just his application would finally get around to doing it in time. But mm -hmm. um, and then what was his other question? Oh, um, netstat minus m will give you details about the memory utilization. It will actually show you how many of those mm -hmm. NMB clusters you're using. You gen you uh, increase the number, but from this thing, you'll see how many are in use, how many are cached, how many of uh, what's the maximum number that have ever been used, and how many do you have available? And you know if that max number is not getting anywhere near the old default, let alone the new one you set, then you know that wasn't the change that made the difference. Uh, so mm -hmm. and that can help. And it breaks down summary uh, and tells you basically how much memory is being used by your networking stack, and that can uh, help you realize, you know, maybe I'm I'm giving too much. I made these buffers too big, and now every socket sure. um there's also in net stat i think just regular minus a or possibly minus no l's doesn't but uh but yeah i think net set minus a n uh or just a will show you the send queue and receive queue uh which tell you how much mm -hmm. data is sitting in those buffers waiting to be processed hmm, okay well, very cool hopefully that gets them off in the right okay. direction then here Okay, next up, Clint has a question about Poudre in a jail. He said, I was listening to the latest episode when Brian said you can run Poudre in a jail. He said he was trying and failing at accomplishing this for several hours yesterday. He said it'd be grateful if we could update our Poudre tutorial with instructions on running in a jail. Have we done that yet, or do I we have plans um, for that, Alan? I had a blog article about my attempt to do it, but that was a long time ago. Uh, mm -hmm. My one recommendation is make sure you're using Poudre dash devel, not uh, the domain line Poudre. Uh, because it has a sure. bunch of the changes and improvements that make it work better in a jail or make it possible to work mm -hmm. in a jail. Um, sure, sure. I don't know if th there might, you might also check wiki.freebsd.org. There might be instructions on there on how to do it. Uh, one of the reasons uh -huh. why I haven't got around to trying it myself yet is that I haven't uh, found somebody else's instructions. Uh, but uh, sure. <laughs> it is something I do want to look into and I hope to have time to, but I have many other things going on as well. So. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we will have a tutorial okay. on that uh, because that'd be cool. That would uh, be cool. And yeah, I, be I might I'm look at maybe even combining it, uh, although that's probably a bad idea. But I'd also like to do one yeah. on doing the uh, cross-building with ARM and uh, combine that or that would be do that really near good. our uh, Raspberry Pi tutorial when I get around to doing that as well. <laughs> yep. Cool. Okay, next up, Esteban. He says, just a brief note to give us all a thumbs up. He said he's enjoying the interviews and the great tutorials. Before finding your show, BSD meant nothing to him. He said, I see the care put into the man pages, wiki pages, code, etc. He said, the BSD world is different from the Wild West Linux world. Well, thank you, Esteban. Yes. We're, uh, we're glad we you're here. Hard. That's nice. We do. We do. <laughs> Okay, next up, Ben, asking about BSD desktop. Mm -hmm. He said, I was wondering what's Chris's thoughts on how to bring the next level of polish to the BSD desktop and laptop user. From an outsider, it appears that PCBSD has been doing some really great work getting the main desktop environments, such as KDE GNOME, to run on top of FreeBSD base. But is there perhaps some need for focus on the underlying FreeBSD and XORG components? Um, he said a number of... Um, yeah, obviously... That's what I would say. One of the biggest things that still kills us is like a Wi-Fi driver doesn't work. Yeah. Somebody, you go to a show, you give a guy a disk, he pops in in his laptop and it's like, oh, and there's no Wi-Fi driver or, or I can't suspend. I yeah. can't resume. Uh, you my know? attack for that one is actually I found that uh, the Intel Centrino Advanced N6205, uh, which is actually what I have in my laptop, my Lenovo, that, and I, so I know mm -hmm. it works, uh, you can buy the little cards for them uh, for like $15. So it's like, mm -hmm. next time I go to show, I'm just going to buy a bunch and bring them with me. And anybody who complains, it'll be like, here, <laughs> problem solved. <laughs> there you go. But um, Put that in. yeah, I, there is a lot of work that went into updating the XORG stuff. Uh, you know, the new cons, mm -hmm. VT, and the new XORG. Uh, that's now the default 9.3 and will be in 10.1 when that comes out very shortly. Uh, well, mm -hmm. not very shortly, but eventually. Um, and that, that'll make a big difference. And there's still ongoing work to get the... Um, the Intel Haswell drivers up to date and, and pull up all that other stuff sure. and bring in the newer Mesa and all that other fun stuff. So the work's being done, but you know, XORG work is kind of thankless and it's, it's, you know, it is there. There's not and really a uh, too, cause there's so many different types, types of hardware yes. out there. It's like, Oh, it works great on this Intel chipset. Not yeah, so good and, here. And yeah. part of the problem with XORG and desktop is that unlike, you know, certain stuff and getting stuff done on like ZFS or, or the network stack, 
uh, there's fewer companies interested in, in making sure that works great. Whereas, mm-hmm. you know, everybody <laughs> wants FreeBSD to be a great router. Only some people care about the sure. desktop. Uh, sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of well, the second part of his question he asked about. Uh, he's looking forward to new XORG, UFI boot, new cons. He says, what do you think the focus should turn to next after that? Um, he's asked if we have any committers that are FreeBSD committers or XORG porters. So I have a port commit bit. I know a few others in the community do. Um, we typically don't work on XORG stuff, though. There's enough uh, higher-level utilities that we're busy playing yeah. with trying to make those work. But uh, you know, I'm not sure about the new FreeBSD core team. Um, Who stands there's where a couple of people that, that are, have interest in desktop. I know um, uh, there are a bunch of them that run PCBSD as their desktop because it's an easier way to have FreeBSD as a desktop. Um, sure. And, and sure. so I know there's some work there. And uh, I know I was talking to a couple of them about stuff, uh, specifically the, the Linux emulation stuff for 64-bit and 32-bit and just mm-hmm. uh, getting that mm-hmm. more up to date so that they can run things like Spotify and just general sure. stuff that, you know, that one or two extra little apps that just makes it into a, a more usable desktop. And he mentions, too, there's been a lot of talk about a new init system with parallel service startup, which is neat. We actually experimented with that a couple of years ago. He said he pointed out servers don't benefit it as much. He thinks the speed improvements, of course, on a laptop will be well received. Do you think PCBSD would consider being the guinea pig for this? And how would the PCBSD team cooperate with the FreeBSD team to ensure that they choose the right one? Well, of course, we'll be the guinea pig for that. I mean, that's what we're doing right now, building GNOME 3 and some of that stuff. Yeah. We're pulling those out of and, uh, GitHub yes, and I, other I think locations. The one that's being looked at is Open Launch D. Um, mm-hmm. For me, mostly as a server guy, I. I very much like the way the init system is now and I'm perfectly happy with it. Sure. Uh, there's actually been some patches that just happened in the last week to uh, do stuff like um, the service command. Currently, uh, when you install something from the ports tree or the package system, mm-hmm. um, unlike on Linux, it's not enabled by default. Uh, sure. Well, currently, that involves, you know, go edit this file and add these lines and so on. Set an rc.conf right. value, uh, blah, but, blah. But uh, yep. we've actually come up with a way to use, uh, there's a tool in base called sysrc that's specifically designed mm-hmm. as a command line way to make changes like that. Uh, well, we wrap mm-hmm. that into the service command. So I don't know if the patch has gone into oh, head okay. yet or not, but it, basically you do service Apache enable and it'll set Just do Apache it. 22 underscore enable equals yes on, in your rc.conf and then service Apache disable will disable it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and just some oh, nice. some easy stuff like that uh, that just makes it that much more usable mm-hmm. for people. And I think uh, that, especially on uh, the machine of a developer who's just trying to to work on stuff or get up a testing environment to test their application mm-hmm. or whatever, I think little changes like that will make the big difference. Um, yeah, it's smoothing off the rough edges. I think a lot of just yeah. the little time so, sucks. It's like, oh wait, now how do I enable you know, this? I understand people wanting parallel launch the and stuff, but uh, personally, I'm very ha- I like the way that I can do evil things with the current RC system. The fact that everything's just a shell script, you know. I saw a presentation at BSD can about putting like functions into your rc.conf and, mm-hmm. and like they built a whole replacement for like puppet in just shell scripts based on, you know, was the host name of this machine a member of a group in the in the ETC mm-hmm. groups file and if so, then apply all this code. <laughs> Oh, nice. Yeah, that was interesting. Well, from my from my perspective, yeah, open launch D or whatever, if if those patches stabilize to the point where we can test them and they're intending on putting them in, then yeah, we are definitely receptive to working with any and all developers who have some neat stuff like that and want us to try it out. And we're we're willing to give that a shot, roll some ISO, see what happens. But yeah, in general, I'm fine with it as long as I can still do stuff with like sysrc where I don't I don't sure. need to grok some like ridiculous format in order to make changes to the file i very yeah, much like that? the just shell variables as the way to control stuff uh, mm-hmm. it's why I, I don't really like the new jail.conf because of the way it works mm-hmm. and it makes it kind of hard sure. to to edit it programmatically cool okay well last up i guess matt sent in some pictures of his free bsd cd yeah collection. so when you first so look at the... it, it just you know it's a bunch of cd spines you're like what's that but uh zoom in a little closer and you see 4.0 yes, here. There's a uh, FreeBSD Ooh. six, FreeBSD five, 2.28. four, <laughs> three, and two. Yeah, it's got quite the collection Dang. of four here. Four eleven, four nine, eight seven six, five mm-hmm. four three two one and zero. He's got. He's missing four dot ten, but he has everything else. 
Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, nice yes. collection there. Uh, that, that, the fours are, were always my favorite FreeBSD, I guess, because that's what I started with. I started on like 4.0 or 4.1, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I went all the way up through 4.11. And, and those couple of years there were probably the most fun I ever had with BSD. Although I'm getting to have a lot more cool. fun now too as being uh, part of the project and actually getting to work on stuff. Yeah, now that you're stuff. committing yeah. and stuff. Like, yeah. It's a whole new level cool. of fun. Okay, well, that pretty much wraps up the questions and feedback. Yep. So uh, as we close the show, of course, we want to mention that all the tutorials can be posted in their entirety at bsdnow.tv. So if you're watching this episode six months from when it airs, go check it out. You can still see the tutorials there. Yep. And we do try and update them periodically. Yes, so if they get a little stale, we try and fix yeah, them up. Yeah, uh, you know, when... Our uh, PF tutorial was about 5.4, and then we updated it to be about mm -hmm. 5.5 and stuff. Yep. And uh, as usual, you can send your questions, comments, show ideas, topics, or maybe a story you'd like mentioned on the show to feedback at bsdnow.tv. We'd love to hear from you. Last week, we talked a little bit about hardware compatibility, and we also have a link where you can check out the uh, New York City BSD users D message. Yes, D. so this is a, so. a big database of the D messages from various uh, machines, right? Uh, Basically, users submit their information, and you can see what it looks like. So, you sure. know, we can see here there's uh, some guy's got his uh, ThinkPad T61 and, and what the D message looked like on OpenBSD. And uh, the more people mm -hmm. that submit these, the more information that's available, and they can eventually, it makes it easier to tell, you know, does this, um, does this hardware, piece of we hardware, I'm, yeah, this. does this piece yeah. of hardware I'm going to buy, it, how's, you know, does the USB work, does it? I guess USB works on almost everything, but they even have uh, some <laughs> nice, uh, like here's a, a Supermicro X9 server. Uh, and mm -hmm. you can see, you know, they're booting up NetBSD 6.99.44, uh, which is their head snapshot, basically. And you can see nice. all the different devices being detected on NetBSD. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah, take a look at that. Uh, you know, if anything, good reference, like you said, yes, if you're about but, to buy a piece know, of hardware or something. Help everybody else out and submit your D messages. Post yours. Yeah. Now. <laughs> it's it's really really easy to do when you want to submit one uh, you fill out a form you put in like a name if you want an email address the description of what the machine was so like your laptop and model mm -hmm. and then the d message and it goes in the database and it benefits everybody nice plus they have uh, yeah, they keep pretty much stats all on the different operating systems uh because the mm -hmm. new york bsd group is is kind of open bsd centric open bsd has about the same many uh count of d messages as free bsd let's see if we can't skew those numbers a little bit <laughs> <laughs> You're and you know there's only like nine people that have tried dragonfly it's like if you have a spare machine sure. just boot dragonfly on it get the d message and post it just so that you can help out and then you know you can go back to doing whatever you're going to do with the machine cool Okay. Of course, if you'd like to come on for an interview or you have a tutorial you'd like to see, please let us know. We do want to do what the viewers want to see. So if there's something that you're really curious about, you got to let us know so we can uh, try and schedule it for a future episode. And of course, you can watch live Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern or 1800 UTC and see how we make the show and all the stuff that goes on in between. Yeah. Sometimes we record interviews yes. early, so you kind of get a sneak peek at the interview yeah. before it officially airs. If you airs. watch this week, you got two interviews instead of one. That's right. That's right. So uh, definitely a good incentive to try and watch us live. So uh, again, really appreciate having you guys all watch today and uh, enjoyed being here with you. We'll be back same time next week. See you next week. Bye.